Well, hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's great to be with you on this Friday, April 8th. And tonight we're talking about what might stop the atrocities in Ukraine. The latest one, a missile strike on a packed train station. We'll have the latest on the rescue and recovery efforts. Now would be a great time for a ceasefire. None has taken hold and hopes for one are dim, but they're not impossible. Yemen has one in effect right now. What does it take to negotiate a ceasefire? Then, it has taken 232 years and 115 prior appointments for a black woman to be selected to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States. Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson addresses the nation one day after the Senate confirmed her to the U.S. Supreme Court. Plus, Will Smith resigned from the Motion Picture Academy over the slap. Today, the Academy announced how it will punish him and how many years that will last. And COVID made us rethink the ways we work. We'll consider some ways to improve your job, from negotiating better terms to maybe working just four days a week. Perhaps the thing we'll remember the most about Russia's war in Ukraine will be the images of civilian deaths. Tonight, at least 50 people, including five children, are dead after reports of two Russian rocket attacks. They hit a train station in the city of Kramatorsk, which is in the eastern part of Ukraine. About 4,000 people were apparently at the station when this happened, mostly women and children, all of whom were trying to flee what would be a major Russian attack there. The remnants of a rocket were found at the station. See that white lettering? Written on it in Russia were these words, for our children. Russia has accused Ukrainian soldiers of committing this attack as a provocation, and it continues to deny any attacks on civilians. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky said Russian forces, quote, are cynically destroying the civilian population, and he added, quote, this is an evil that has no limits, unquote. Meanwhile, some help against missile attacks is on the way from a NATO member. Slovakia is donating a missile defense system to Ukraine. President Biden says the U.S. facilitated that transfer. NBC's Ali Arouzi starts us off tonight from Lviv. And Ali, I understand there are some eyewitness accounts of what happened at the station in Kramatorsk. What are they telling us? Hi, Joshua. That's right. I mean, it was a scene of devastation and carnage at that uh, rail station. As you mentioned, there were about 4,000 people trying to get out of there. A lot of them were there overnight, women and children, 50 people killed, at least five children. Uh, And the mayor of that town is saying that, you know, dozens of people were taken to the hospital. Uh, Many of them had lost arms and legs. The operating room there was chaos. Apparently, they were operating on 40 people at the same time. And that's because the rocket the Russians launched in there had cluster munitions. That explodes in midair and then delivers uh, uh, bomblets, as they call them, to cause as much damage in as wide an area as possible. Uh, And it was a horrifying scene for people running away from their homes because they wanted to get away from a Russian onslaught. Uh, We have some sound from the press officer of the Kramatorsk. Let's take a listen to what they had to say. There were many killed and injured here. There were ambulances, the police, fire engines. The cars were burning nearby. It was hell on earth. They all had shrapnel injuries, because this is the kind of shrapnel that pieces are scattered around here, and people were wounded by those pieces that were those fragments that killed them. Uh, And Joshua, President uh, Zelensky said that there were no military personnel at that railway station. They were just civilians. He's calling this another war crime that has to be brought to a tribunal in a long list of war crimes that the Russians have committed here. As it relates to the fighting of this war, Ali, talk about how this missile system, this S-300 defense system, might affect Ukraine's campaign against the Russians and how they might react. We've already heard the Russians say that bringing more weapons into this conflict might have a negative effect on peace talks. I think the Ukrainians would say we're well past that. But what do we expect this S-300 system to do in terms of the balance on the ground? 
Well, this is going to be a huge help to the Ukrainians. From day one, this is one of the three things they've been asking for. They wanted the air defense systems, they wanted the MiG jets, and they wanted the skies closed. Well, they finally got one of the things that they really need to fight the Russians. If that S-300 air defense system had been around Kramatorsk railway station today, they possibly could have intercepted those missiles. And that's why they've been calling for them day in, day out. We need these defensive systems and you know your point is is very valid i don't think anything the ukrainians do to defend themselves uh is going to help in these peace efforts anytime the ukrainians try to defend themselves anytime anybody tries to give them any ammunition or weapons the russians say well this is going to complicate peace talks this is going to make it very very difficult to make some kind of arrangement and that's because the russians are not interested in peace talks right now they have found uh, any excuse not to come to terms with the ukrainian demands for Zelensky not to meet Putin and Zelensky has said time and time again look I'll meet Putin unconditionally any time to bring an end to this war but Putin doesn't seem to be ready the president of the European Commission Ursula von der Leyen met with President Zelensky today and as I understand it there was some positive news for Ukraine how did that turn out uh, it, it was some positive news. She, she went to Bucha first, uh, just to fill you in on that. She went to visit one of those new mass graves uh, that were uncovered there, and she was visibly shocked by what she saw. She lit a candle there, and then from there she went to meet uh, President Zelensky, and she told him that she's going to make all the efforts to fast-track Ukraine getting into the European Union because of what Russia has done in this war, because of the atrocities they've committed. And Joshua, that's exactly what Putin didn't want. He didn't want Ukraine to join the European Union. So his plans of, you know, amassing all these troops on the border and attacking this country have backfired because those things that he doesn't want to happen are slowly coming into place. They are trying to get the Ukrainians into the European Union. They are giving them these air defense systems. And as this war drags on, the Ukrainians will probably find more support from the European Union, more inclusion. So this has badly backfired on Putin. And before I let you go, as soon as I saw that video of President von der Leyen talking to President Zelensky in person, I thought, is that safe? Can she get in and out of there safely? How is the effort to just make Ukraine traversable going? I mean, there were supposed to be, I believe, 10 evacuation corridors that were supposed to open up today, including some that were meant for Mariupol. How is the effort going just in terms of making it safe to get around? Um, well, it's the eastern, very far eastern part of the country, the Donbass area, that is now the focus of the Russian attacks. Uh, there were a few thousand people that got out of Mariupol again today, again, on private uh, convoys, private cars. But, you know, it's the east that's very dangerous. And one of the reasons the European commissioner was able to visit Zelensky is because the Russian troops failed to take Kiev. They failed to take those suburbs. And according to U.S. military experts, they have quit that area. They've gone back into Russia. They've gone into Belarus. So that has made it a lot safer for her to get into those areas. But for how long those areas will, say, will remain relatively safe uh, is anybody's guess. U.S. officials saying that it's not going to be long before the Russians come back into Ukrainian territory. First the Donbass, if they're successful there, then back to Kyiv. Thank you, Ali. Please stay safe as best you can. That's NBC's Ali Arusi starting us off tonight from Lviv. So where do things go from here in this war? How might it end? One option that's been tried so far without success, a ceasefire. If one can take hold, it would create space for aid workers to get in and out more safely. Calming down these hostilities could, hopefully, lead to an agreement that would end the war. But right now, ceasefire talks between the two sides have stalled. The recent attack in Bucha has affected Ukraine's willingness to keep trying. Let's get into all that with NBC News national security and international affairs analyst Michael McFall, former U.S. ambassador to Russia. Ambassador, good to see you again. Welcome. Great to be back. Is there a standardized diplomatic definition of what a ceasefire would involve, or are they all different for different circumstances? I just want to make sure we have the right lens on what we're talking about when we talk about a ceasefire. Well, that's a good question. Ceasefires are different than peace agreements, right? And sometimes they come before you get an actual peace settlement and you negotiate everything out. 
Um, I'm not optimistic, uh, just building on what you guys were just talking about, that there's going to be one anytime soon. Uh, Mr. Putin seems quite uh, focused right now on taking more territory in that in that southeast portion that you guys were just talking about, Mariupol first and foremost, and eventually he wants to connect Crimea to Donbas uh, and and take all of Donbas. Uh, he hasn't he doesn't have that yet, and so my guess is that he won't be interested in a ceasefire until he uses firepower to do just that. There's another term that's come up. I think we should define the uh, the Ukraine had suggested an armistice agreement early in the negotiations. How does an armistice differ from a ceasefire? Oh, you're, you're getting too far in the weeds for me, Joshua. I've done, That's I why I brought sure. it up. That's why I brought yeah. it up. Well, uh, you know, I, I, let me put it this way. Um, armistices are, 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 that can last for a long, long time. Um, you know, they can be in place for where people just agree to disagree, that they don't sign a peace agreement, but they agree to stop fighting, right? So North Korea, South Korea, there's never been a formal peace treaty there. Uh, Cyprus, uh, Turkey, uh, that island has been divided for decades. Uh, they, haven't, they haven't had a settlement, but they also haven't had war. And then there are, there are other things called frozen conflicts that you have more in the post-communist world, the post-Soviet world, where the borders are, um, uh, up for gra that there's no agreement about the borders of the state. So you have that in Moldova with an enclave, Transnistria. You have that with two regions of Georgia, uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Uh, and you used to have that uh, in Donbas uh, and Crimea in Ukraine before the, the Russians uh, escalated their uh, horrendous, horrible, heinous uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and in all of those places, uh, they've agreed to disagree about where the borders are. There's been no peace settlement, but there also is not an active war, at least not in Moldova and Georgia. Obviously, in Ukraine, there is an active war. Last week, we learned that, or about a week ago, we learned that there was going to be a ceasefire in the long civil war in Yemen. They've been fighting since 2015. Last time they had anything like this was years ago. It's been quite a while, and this war involves proxies in Saudi Arabia and Iran and you know the government and Houthi rebels, and that has been going on for years and years. But there is a ceasefire in place now in the Yemen civil war. Is there anything we can learn from conflicts like that or from other conflicts about what it takes to even make a ceasefire happen, let alone make one stick? Clearly, they're not impossible, and if you can have one in a conflict that seems as intractable as Yemen's civil war, maybe you could have one here. Well, it's a great question. Um, I would say a couple of things. One, uh, remember, uh, Putin invaded Ukraine in 2014, uh, not this year. Uh, and in that conflict in the east, in Donbas, they've had multiple ceasefires over the, the eight-year period. Uh, and every time they're, they're put in place, they've fallen apart. Uh, so in this particular war right now, the escalation of the war, let's call it the, the second war or the escalation, um, I don't think you're going to get a, a ceasefire that holds until you get two conditions. One, you get a stalemate on the battlefield uh, when both sides believe that they can't use military force to advance their interests. And then two, you sign a peace agreement that everybody thinks makes them better off than fighting. Um, and don't get me wrong, if you can get a ceasefire and you can save civilians and corridors, humanitarian corridors, of course, negotiators should try to do those things. But long term ceasefires that hold, I don't think really, at least the Ukrainian Russian experience has been for eight years, it's never held because there's never been a permanent peace settlement, a peace agreement. They've been negotiating over that for eight years. And until you get to that, you don't get a ceasefire that lasts. Can I ask you about Ukraine's position in all this? I mean, after the attacks that we've seen in Bucha and elsewhere, the Ukrainian position seems to be, don't tell us to cease firing, tell Russia to cease firing. They're the ones who started this. It's almost like if I'm in an alley and someone punches me in the face and a cop shows up and says, hey, hey, guys, cut it out. I'd be like, I'm not do. he punched me. I don't know why you're telling me this, tell him this. And that seems to be Ukraine's argument. Don't talk to Ukraine about a ceasefire. We didn't start firing in the first place. What does that do to the possibility of a ceasefire, even if they're right? It seems like you still have to get both sides to agree to go, 
okay, fine, we're gonna stop shooting regardless of who started it. But how does that factor in? Well, that gets me back to what I think is the more important word, uh, precondition, and that's stalemate. Uh, so, so you can ask anybody to stop shooting, but if, if one side thinks they're advancing because of shooting, they're gonna keep shooting. And that's Putin. Putin thinks, despite all the horrors we've seen, but all the genocidal terroristic acts, uh, th that rocket that you just showed that says Zadieti, right? Four children on it. Uh, just horror, I can't think of the right adjective to describe it. There it is right there. Um, uh, but he has a strategy. He thinks by doing this, it's putting pressure on Zelensky to negotiate because he, Zelensky wants to save his people. Um, and two, he wants to take more territory. Um, and, and until he has been stopped from taking territory, uh, you know, talk about ceasefire doesn't matter. So if you really want peace in Ukraine, uh, the best thing we can do is to give Ukraine more arms so that they can fight to get to that stalemate. That, to me, is a precondition for an actual ceasefire that will hold. One last thing real quick before I let you go, and I'm sorry I misspoke. The Yemen civil war started in late 2014, not 2015. Sorry about that. One last thing. The Ukrainians have been calling for things like a no-fly zone. A number of our viewers have been asking, why doesn't NATO get more involved and help kind of force Russia to back off? Would that help with a ceasefire or just raise the possibility of the violence getting worse? or maybe a little bit of both? So a no-fly zone is a euphemism for declaration of war uh, on Russia. Uh, because if you try to enforce a no-fly zone as an American pilot, you'll be forced one day to shoot down a Russian pilot. And that will be considered a declaration of war by Russia. So if you support uh, a declaration of war with Russia, uh, then that should be your position. By the way, the US Congress should then vote on it. That's their constitutional right. responsibility. And that, therefore, I'm not a supporter of that. I, don't, I, I support the president. Uh, we do not want to de declare war on Russia. But everything short of that, we need to be doing more of to get to the stalemate that I was talking about. And as we move to this, as they move, I should say, as Ukraine and Russia move to the next phase of this war, I think it's gonna take on a much more conventional uh, characteristics. It's not just gonna be lobbing artillery shells from afar into cities. Uh, it's gonna yeah. involve more heavy artillery, tanks. And that's why you hear President Zelensky today saying, we need tanks. We need airplanes, we need S-300s. Great that that is coming in order to fight this new phase of our war against Russia. Former U.S. Ambassador to Russia, Michael McFaul, always good to see you, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Now, on Monday, we will speak with Kenneth Roth from Human Rights Watch. We'll be talking to him about alleged war crimes in Ukraine, and we'd love to add your questions to that conversation. So send your questions to us. We are at NBC Now Tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Leave us a voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. That's 888-575-2622. Or email us, now tonight at NBCNews.com. Still to come, we will have more on that horrific atta attack on the rail station in Ukraine, and later, April is Autism Awareness Month. Children who struggle with noises and lights are finding more places that are accommodating them, including even theme parks. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. We have been talking about the missile attack on that train station in eastern Ukraine. People have flocked to the station and to nearby hospitals to find their loved ones. Our report on the aftermath has some rather disturbing images. With that said, from our partners at Sky News, here's correspondent John Sparks. It sits on the grass outside the station in Kramatorsk, the remnants of a ballistic missile, its work already done. And on the side, there is a message, Zadeti, or done for the children. A message of revenge, it seems, sprayed in white. This weapon was aimed at the only place in this embattled city where large groups were gathering. The train station was packed with people trying to find a way out, some 4,000 waiting for trains heading to western Ukraine. 
They were running from the Russian military, but this brutal war came to them. You can't unsee scenes like these. Neither can you forget the sound. High explosives and bits of shrapnel tearing through passengers waiting for a train. How many dead bodies and the children, the children, says one. The authorities say at least 50 people were killed, including five children. More than a hundred have been injured. We were in this booking hall a couple of days ago and it was full. It was full of people and their their personal possessions as they waited to board trains out on the platform. And there was a singer, a famous singer, who stood there at the doors and he sang to everybody and they were they were tearful as they as they boarded trains for Lviv and now bags without their owners left in the middle of the hall. We hear phones ringing, friends and loved ones trying to contact them. The station manager stayed in post when the missile struck and she was still fielding inquiries when we arrived. This man was looking for his mother. He could see her bag, but he didn't know where she was. The casualties were taken to area hospitals, and at City Hospital number three, some had to wait in the halls. There's a war on, and they don't have the staff or the beds. Outside, friends and loved ones waited for news. This woman's son had been caught in the blast and was undergoing surgery. A 17-year-old called Nastia had been waiting for the train to Kyiv. Can you describe for us what happened, what you saw? Ludmila had been trying to evacuate to Ushgorod in western Ukraine. How Russia denies all responsibility, suggesting Ukraine bombed its own station, adding it doesn't use missiles of this type. These assertions are widely disputed and deeply resented in Ukraine, whose president called this an act of evil. John Sparks, Sky News in Kramatorsk. We will get to some of today's other top stories in a moment, including Will Smith's punishment from the Academy over the slap at the Oscars. Plus, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson is on her way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Today, she celebrated her confirmation with remarks at the White House. And the International Space Station is about to get its first all-civilian crew. More on the launch and what it cost these astronauts to go. Just ahead, stay close. It has been almost two weeks since Will Smith slapped Chris Rock at the Oscars, and today the Motion Picture Academy slapped Will Smith with a major penalty. He is banned from all Academy functions, in person or virtual, for 10 years. However, the Academy did not ban him from the Oscar nominations, so theoretically, he could win another statuette, even if he cannot accept it at the ceremony. 
In an open letter, the Academy apologized for not adequately addressing the slap when it happened. The group has said that Mr. Smith was asked to leave but refused. The Academy said it hopes that, quote, this can begin a time of healing and restoration for all involved and impacted, unquote. Will Smith responded to the announcement with a seven-word statement, quote, I accept and respect the Academy's decision, unquote. Four men's anger over Michigan's COVID restrictions grew into an alleged plot to kidnap the governor, Gretchen Whitmer, and today their jury trial ended with no convictions. The jury found Daniel Harris and Brandon Caserta not guilty of conspiracy. Mr. Harris was also acquitted on explosives and gun charges. The jury deadlocked on the other defendants, Adam Fox and Barry Croft. Since the judge declared a mistrial, those two could stand trial again. Ty Garbin pleaded not guilty for the plot and became a witness for the prosecution. Mr. Garbin said that the plan was to get the governor and cause chaos in hopes of starting a civil war before the 2020 election. A statement from Governor Whitmer called for accountability to address, quote, violent, divisive rhetoric that is all too common across our country, unquote. Meanwhile, the U.S. Supreme Court will soon have a new justice. Today, federal appeals judge Ketanji Brown Jackson celebrated her historic confirmation. Here is an extended excerpt of her remarks at the White House. It has taken 232 years and 115 prior appointments for a black woman to be selected to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States. I am feeling up to the task primarily because I know that I am not alone. I am standing on the shoulders of my own role models generations of Americans who never had anything close to this kind of opportunity, but who got up every day and went to work believing in the promise of America. And in the poetic words of Dr. Maya Angelou, I do so now while bringing the gifts my ancestors gave me. and the dream and the hope of the sleep. Quoting from the end of Maya Angelou's Still I Rise in her remarks at the White House. Now, yesterday, the Senate confirmed Judge Jackson 53 to 47. Only three Republicans voted to confirm her. She will remain an appellate judge until the Supreme Court's term ends this summer. Then, in June or July, Justice Stephen Breyer plans to retire. Judge Jackson is his successor. History is also being made today in human spaceflight at the International Space Station. The first all-civilian crew is on its way there. This morning, the commercial spaceflight company Axiom Space launched its rocket from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. None of its four crew members is a government astronaut. Axiom's John Rackham celebrated the historic mission during the launch. Together, a new chapter begins. Godspeed AX-1. The crew will spend eight days aboard the International Space Station. As for how they got to take this flight, the commander, Michael Lopez Alegria, is a former NASA astronaut. According to the Associated Press, the other three members paid their way aboard. $55 million each. Coming up, the future of work. Thousands of Americans are part of an experiment trying out a four-day work week. We'll explain how it works. Plus, how do you negotiate for what you really want at your job? We'll get some tips and answer your questions when we come back. So how is work going these days? Are you at the job you had before the pandemic? Maybe you're looking for something new right now. And perhaps your work day looks nothing like it did before COVID. Either way, how close are you to having a really great job, something that feels worthwhile and prosperous and fair? Tonight, we're taking a look at the ways we work and how some folks are rethinking it. One idea to change the work week, make it shorter, from five days to four. 
Some call it the Great Resignation. According to the Labor Department, 47 million Americans quit their jobs in 2021. Multiple surveys show the reasons, burnout, stagnant wages, lack of fulfillment, and a poor work-life balance. Shifting to a four-day work week is gaining momentum as a possible solution. Charlotte Lockhart supports that idea. She's the founder and CEO of Four Day Week Global, a nonprofit based in New Zealand. The great resignation shows us that actually employees are choosing who they're going to work for and who is that company that will give them the work environment, the work hours, and the, um, and, and the, the, the fulfillment that they want. And they are choosing to go with companies that offer programs like a four-day week. According to the group's research, 63% of businesses say a four-day week made it easier to attract and retain talent. 78% of four-day employees said they were happier and less stressed. What's important for the employees is that we get a lot of self-worth and value out of a knowing what our purpose for being in the business truly is and what uh, the business wants from us in terms of its productive outcome. And when we're clear about that, we actually get a lot more emotional um, happiness and emotional calming from being clear about what our purpose is. Some companies have shifted permanently to a four-day week. In San Francisco, the financial technology firm Bolt tried it in the fall of 2021. Jennifer Christie is Bolt's chief people officer. What we said is, let, let's make sure, first of all, since so we, we don't cram five days into four, let's focus on the things that are most important. So how can we look at the work we're doing and identify what is going to have the most impact and what is going to be the biggest priorities for us. So setting those outcomes. So it's not about how many hours you work and it's not about how active you are. It really is about what outcomes are you achieving and are those outcomes the ones that matter most. Bolt says the outcomes of its pilot program were stunning. Overwhelming majorities of the employees and managers said they supported a shorter work week. Most of them reported being more efficient, having a better work-life balance, and fewer unnecessary meetings. The prospect of increased productivity is helping the four-day work week gain traction globally. In Iceland, 85% of workers have adopted it. Belgium just announced plans to try it out too. This year, Panasonic introduced it as an option. Pilot programs are underway in the U.S., Canada, Spain, and the UK. And a bill from Democratic Congressman Mark Takano of California would standardize four-day work weeks nationwide. My 32-hour work week act would simply amend the Fair Labor Standards Act, which was originally passed in 1935, and that was the original law that limited our work week to 40 hours, or said that you can earn overtime pay after 40 hours, my bill would simply change that act so that people could start, workers could start earning overtime pay at 32 hours. In December, the Congressional Progressive Caucus endorsed Takano's bill, but so far it has no Republican co-sponsors. Brent Orell of the American Enterprise Institute, a center-right think tank, says now's not the right time. To mandate the policy, I think, comes with a host of kind of un unintended consequences that could end up making workers' situations actually worse as well as um, exacerbating the problems that we have right now with the tight labor market and, um, and the inflationary pressures that are driven largely by the big wage increases that are currently going on in the economy. And Mark Efron of the HR consulting firm, The Talent Strategy Group, says a four-day work week could make inequality worse. This says, hey, Karen gets to go to one extra hot yoga class a week because she gets Fridays off. Uh, that doesn't change the experience for the person who is changing beds at the local hotel, who's driving the bus, who's slinging our garbage into the back of a truck. Uh, they still need to actually show up and do the work. And so while it's lovely for the people who have the opportunity, uh, I'm not sure it really contributes to a more equitable uh, society. So clearly lots of mixed opinions about it, but we asked you what you thought of a four-day work week, and we got a lot of responses. Randall tweeted, many of us are working many more hours than 40 in a typical week, more than five days a week, especially in the COVID era. So while it's not a significant change, it's a change in the right direction. Anita writes, this would work well for people without the need for childcare. 
And Jordan writes, I can't see how 4x10 works well for every employee, especially those with children. The conversation should be about lowering total weekly hours, removing unneeded meetings and distractions, amen to that, and still getting the same productivity. Giving people more freedom is what most want. Thank you very much for all of these responses. Feel free to keep them coming. Now, depending on where you work, you just might be able to negotiate a different schedule. If not four by 10 or something like it, is there something else your boss might give you that would make your job better? What would it take to ask for it and get it? Let's continue now with MSNBC reporter Daniela Pierre Bravo. She's the co-author of Earn It, Know Your Value and Grow Your Career in Your 20s and Beyond. Daniela, welcome. Good to have you with us. Hey, Joshua. How are you? Thanks so much for having me. I'm good. I'm good. I, I, and not to ignore Mika Brzezinski. That is, not, that is not done at 30 Rock. But I just want to acknowledge both of the authors of that book. Let me get to some questions f about one of the biggest aspects of negotiating on the job, and that's negotiating your pay. Victoria writes, my boss promised me a raise and a promotion in my title over a year ago, and it hasn't happened yet. I do so much work, and I feel like he is just stringing me along. I know I need to have a talk with him, but I also worry because what if you upset your supervisor and then they won't give you a good reference in the future? Daniela, what would you say to Victoria? Yeah, I would say, first of all, this is a really prevalent problem for women. We always feel like we need to accommodate and that we're, you know, coming at a bad time. We need to forget about it. Don't take it personal because it's not. Uh, bring your data game. It, find out why your boss is not giving you the time that you need to be able to talk about what you do, which is bringing your value. And be specific about the number we want. I think, you know, when we tippy toe around the ask, it takes away the value of our negotiating power. Write down the objective of the negotiation. One of the reasons why your boss might be taking longer is because you're not being specific about the ask that you are asking for. Is it money? Is it more flexibility? Is it more responsibility? And again, don't take it personally, because if you don't get a no, make sure to follow up. And Victoria, I think what she needs to do is ask for metrics. If it's taking way longer than expected, don't be afraid to follow up with your boss and ask, what is it that I need to be doing in order to take that no from a yes? We got a story from Lisa about negotiating a raise. Here's what Lisa left in our inbox. I work at a hospital and I have not been given a raise for almost five years. Throughout COVID, I worked less at first in 2020 and could not receive unemployment because my work was not less than 20, my work hours was not less than 24 hours a week. I have been told by the employees that I work with that they make more money than me and that's always been my suspicion. And I've asked time and time again to be brought up to a rate that I felt was more in line with my job description and what I've been asked to do. Lisa, I appreciate you sharing that story. And Daniela, I have to say, I feel like Lisa's touching on something that I have found works for me when negotiating pay is not negotiating so much for the money, but for the value that I bring for the money that I'm paid. And just making it clear, when you pay me for this, you're getting this. You're getting way more than your return on investment. And maybe that's part of the issue, just the fact that she is one of these essential workers who helped keep us alive through COVID. Maybe there's a value proposition that she could make to help advocate for herself. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, at the end of the day, that's what a negotiating, uh, what, what a negoti negotiation is, is being able to articulate what exactly that you bring that is valuable to the company. And one of the things that I like to say is that for employees like this, you are an LLC. Think of yourself as an LLC and you have to take care of you. You need to make sure that you're going in there and asking for what you deserve. And, you know, at the end of the day, we are in a world where there are so many people who had to work extra during the pandemic. And nowadays, you know, there is a reason why the great resignation exists. So I would say, Consider taking the offer of being able to walk away if you are working somewhere where you're not getting paid what your value is. Sarah had a question about negotiating workplace conditions. Sarah emailed, 
I have chronic conditions and nutrition is key to keeping me healthy. I need to have an office job, set availability for lunch, and no temptation while driving around to just run to Mickey D's. I don't know how to approach that request when my position specifically had this driving component that I knew about when I took it. Daniela, what would you say to Sarah? Yeah, a chronic condition can be really tough. I think the key here is painting the opportunity for both sides. So if there is a compromise or a benefit to your health or accommodations that are needed, think of it as advocating for yourself for the work that you do. So at the end of the day, an employer wants to retain and keep and have an employee that is happy, but you have to paint the opportunities for both sides. So what is it that you need that you can advocate for yourself for? And how can you show them that they're going to gain value by giving you the benefit that you need? And if that's the mental health benefit or you know a benefit for your health, then you should approach it that way. I wanna to get to just for the control room, question six on our list, and by the way, we appreciate, Daniela, we appreciate you being here. Just know that no advice can substitute for the advice of your own counsel, your union representatives, shop stewards, or people who are more intimately acquainted with the specifics of your situation. This is just food for thought, but you may need more specific guidance for you. Before I let you go, Daniela, another COVID-related question from Ken. Ken writes, many workers have shown they can be more efficient by working from home. Meanwhile, lots of people are complaining that schools need to be held in person. How can schools prepare workers for online work when we don't want to do online schools? Danielle, I know that online education is controversial in a number of places. Some places have found it's not as effective as in-person learning. But I do take Ken's point in terms of figuring out working from home for those who are able to work from home. What guidance would you have there? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's all about the value proposition. How can you articulate your value in order to do it more effectively to your employer? So if that requires you to do more, rem more remote work, be proactive about how to articulate that to your employer. You know, how can you show them that, again, it's a value proposition, paint the opportunity for both sides so that you can get what you want and advocate for it effectively and that the other person is receptive to what you're saying? MSNBC's Daniela Pierre Bravo, co-author with Mika Brzezinski of Earn It. Know your value and grow your career in your 20s and beyond. Daniela, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. We are exactly one week away from the deadline to file your taxes. If you're like me, they're still on your to-do list. and You probably have questions. I know I do. Well, fortunately for you and me, on Thursday, Washington Post columnist Michelle Singletary will answer your questions. She is one of my absolute favorite people. So please do send your questions our way. Remember, we're at NBC Now tonight on social media. Leave us a voicemail with your tax day questions, 888-575-2NBC, or email now tonight at NBCNews.com. Up next, children on the autism spectrum can struggle with things that other kids might find fun, like the noise and energy of amusement parks. We'll see how some parks are making visits much more accessible and hopefully just as much fun before we go. When you enter an amusement park or a theme park, what's the first thing you notice? The loud rides, screaming adults, Screaming children, the crowds, maybe the smell of fried Oreos. For some folks, all those sights, smells, and sounds are what you come to the park for. But for people with special needs, or folks on the autism spectrum, they can just make you shut down. Six Flags is among the parks adapting to that. It's installed low sensory rooms in the parks. The idea is for people with special needs to be able to catch a break and relax and reset. Some parks are also offering a sensory guide helping families decide which rides may be best for them. And others are adapting the parks themselves, offering special days so that kids with unique needs can have fun like anyone else. Six Flags St. Louis is one of those parks, and joining us now is its public relations manager, Elizabeth Gottway. Ms. Gottway, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I am a huge theme park nerd. I'm a Florida native, so it kind of is my birthright. So I think this is really interesting that parks, including Six Flags and Universal, our corporate cousins, are finding ways to adapt to more guests. Talk about these, this low sensory room, first of all. How did that come about? Uh, well, we hosted a weekend 
um, about two years ago, I guess. And we just hosted this this weekend. Um, we put up a temporary sensory room. We really didn't know how our guests would respond to it. Um, the, the response we got was quite frankly, just overwhelming um, from families that came in and told us, um, you know, we can't normally come to a theme park because it's just, it's too much. It's fun and it's thrilling, but it's just sensory overload. And then they're here maybe an hour or two and, and then they have to find some place to go. And it, it's really hard if there isn't any place. So they came that weekend and we had this room set up and we were just overwhelmed by the response. And we decided then we need to do this. Um, interestingly enough, our company as a whole is really undertaking becoming um, autism certified. And that involves training um, by all of, by 80% of our team members. Um, it involves training on how to better accommodate our guests who have sensory needs. Um, it, it requires having the sensory guide um, that we can give to guests. And then it requires having a space in the park. It doesn't have to be a room. It can be someplace outside, but it's a place that is um, kind of out of the way. It's right. lower sensory. It's a little quieter that they can just kind of get away from the thrills. Talk about the, the quiet ride times that Six Flags has been offering. You offered them last Sunday. There's going to be another one this Sunday. I think it's interesting, but having been to a lot of theme parks, I'm not sure how you make a place like Six Flags quiet. That's kind of the noise and the intensity <laughs> is sort of what people go for. But what would guests notice on those quiet ride times? Right. You know, think about it. The, the noise and the constant stuff going on is what drives us, right? That's part of the thrill for us. But it isn't part of the thrill for everyone. If you have sensory sensitivities, that isn't part of the thrill for you. So what we did last Sunday and we're doing again this Sunday is something that we're just trying um, to see how what kind of response we get. And it's called a quiet early ride time. So our park normally opens at 1030. So from 930 a.m. to 1030 a.m., we just have a few of our lower sensory rides available. And the park is as quiet as we can possibly make it. Of course, you have uh, spiels going on telling people what's going on with the ride. Um, you might have an announcement. But other than that, there's no music. There's no games being called. There's nothing going on. It's as quiet as we can make it. In addition to that, we have a bubble zone during that hour. And then we also have a character um, out in a over in a quiet space where they can go in and get a meet and greet and a photo with this char character. Or during the day, those things are just overwhelming because there's so many people around and so much going on around them. So we're kind of trying to just test this out. We've gotten a good response from it. Um, this Sunday, we're actually going to make the first hour of our normal park operation quiet as well. Um, and our hope is that we can expand upon this and maybe you know do multiple um, Sundays throughout the year of just this quiet time. I have to say this is a, a two things. One, this is a, a smart idea, I think, because there's all kinds of people, whether they're on the spectrum or not, that need to know that the park gets that you need a break from the nonstop. I've had to kind of learn, like, if you start to get overwhelmed, go to a gift shop, like go in the back of a gift shop, go toward one of the restaurants. Like there are places you can go in the park to sort of to catch a break. I would also be remiss if I did not on behalf of our corporate cousins say that the Universal Parks also do have some opportunities for guests with cognitive disabilities. Universal Orlando Resort has a guide for guests with cognitive disabilities. For parents who might come on another day beside these Sundays, before I gotta let you go, what advice would you have for them? If they're traveling with someone on the autism spectrum, what should they do to make sure that everybody can go to your park and have a good time? Well, I, we would tell guests, um, you can go to accessibilitycard.org um, and you can find that information on our website. Um, and they can actually register and get an accessibility card that they have with them. This will help them with ride lines, not waiting as long, um, so that so that they don't have to stand in those lines. And that sometimes creates um, some, some anxiety for our guests. Um, they can do that. Know when you come in, grab this guide. Um, you know, you can grab this guide in our ride information center. Grab that. Look at the rides. Know where the sensory, the low sensory space is, um, so that you can get to it quickly if you need to, and take advantage of those things. Our our employees are trained to help make the day better 
for our guests with, with autism, with sensory uh, sensitivities. And honestly, we like to say not disabilities, but guests of all abilities. We all have varying disability uh, abilities in life. Um, that just means we might need something different than the, the, the guest next to you. So know these things when you come in, stop by guest relations, stop by our ride information center, you right. know, find out what's available to you. Um, we're here, we're here to help the, make the day better and make it a great experience for all of our guests. Yeah. And as a patron, I've had to learn over the years, don't judge the family next to you whose kid is freaking out. You don't know what they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. You don't know what they came into the park with that day. Just take it easy. You might be able to actually help them get their day back on track. Elizabeth Absolutely. Gottway of Six Flags St. Louis, I appreciate you making time. Thank you so much. Thank you. And hey, thank you for making time for us. Don't forget, we're looking for your questions ahead of next week's tax deadline. We are at NBC Now tonight on social media. Leave us a voicemail or send us an email. Morgan Radford is going to be in the chair for me on Monday. I am back on Tuesday, but until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thank you for making time for us and enjoy your weekend. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.